Good evening aspirants welcome to daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy today's date is 22nd July 2024 displayed here are the list of topics that we are going to see today we have selected news articles from two days newspaper that is from yesterday's newspaper and from today's newspaper these five articles cover the yesterday's newspaper and these articles are from today's newspaper now let us get into the discussion look at this science page article it talks about a study published by journal called plus 1 This journal has utilized the data from National Sample Survey Organization and published the reports on morbidity rates of India. See morbidity rate can be defined as the rate of disease or illness occurring to a set of population. It is different from mortality rate. Here you have to know the difference between morbidity rate and mortality rate. Mortality rate is a number of death in particular population whereas morbidity rate is a rate of disease or illness occurring in the population. So this is the difference. Now let us discuss the important points and data mentioned in this article. See the morbidities can be divided into four types. Firstly, the infectious and communicable diseases, then non-communicable diseases, disability, injury and other diseases. So these are the four classifications of morbidity. Now let us see the morbidity trends in India that is mentioned in the newspaper. Across India, the non-communicable diseases have increased from 1995 to 2018. So there is a increase in the rate of non-communicable diseases. Diseases like diabetes, heart diseases, stroke, cancer are the examples of non-communicable diseases. If you look at the trends in the states, Kerala has the highest morbidity rate and it also has highest rate of communicable and non-communicable diseases. Andhra Pradesh, West Bengal, Punjab, Karnataka also have high morbidity rates. The northern and northeastern states, especially Manipur, Meghalaya, have the lowest morbidity rates. The non-communicable disease rates are higher in women and this rate has tripled between 1995 to 2004. So please note that non-communicable disease rates are higher in women compared to men and the overall increase in non-communicable diseases is seen in past two decades. Even though the prevalence of NCDs have declined in several states, it is still large number overall in the country. If we talk about the infectious and communicable diseases, their prevalence also nearly doubled in the last decades. So there is also increase in infectious and communicable diseases. Now why is the morbidity rate in India is increasing? There is a change in distribution of diseases due to various determinants like mode of transmission of disease and risk factors, demographic and geographical differences. Social and economic factors also play a major role. Access to health care, funds for infrastructure of health care system also plays important role in this increasing morbidity rate in India. So in this article we have discussed the important facts and data regarding morbidity rate in India. With this let us move to the next news article discussion. Now look at this article. Recently a bill was introduced in Karnataka to provide reservation to local residents in private sector. So we have discussed about this in previous videos. The bill was regarding reservation of up to 50% for local residents in managerial category jobs and of up to 70% in non-managerial category jobs. Now who are considered as local residents? See according to the bill, the people who are born in Karnataka and who have lived in Karnataka for 15 years and who can write and speak Kannada are considered as local residents. There is only one relaxation to the industries and they can take three years to train or engage the locals for the job. So they can apply to the government to get the relaxation norms. Now let us discuss what are the constitutional issues related to this bill. Firstly, Article 16. This article says that there must be equality of opportunity in public employment. It also prohibits discrimination based on place of birth or residence in any case of employment. So there is a issue with this article. The next clash is that reservation based on residence can only be done by parliament and not by state legislative assembly according to the article 16 class 3. So the reservation bills like this can be only made by parliament and not by state legislative assemblies. Then there is article 16 class 4 which says that the state has power to make reservation in employment only if their people are not adequately represented or in favor of backward class of citizens. It is also important to note that the term reservation based on residence is not mentioned with respect to the power of state to make law for reservation. It is also clearly mentioned in article 35 that only parliament alone has the power to enact laws regarding residential requirement in employment. So there is clearly a clash in these articles. This bill also affects the right to freedom of movement of citizens throughout the India which is mentioned under article 19. This bill also affects the right to settle and reside in any state under Articles 19. 
This is because the local quota will not allow people belonging to one state to seek employment in another state. This bill also affects the right of employers because they are restricted to employ within a certain choice which violates the citizen's right to practice any profession. So there is a clash with the Article 19. And lastly, according to Indra Savani case, the total reservation should not exceed 50% of available post which also include the domicile reservation. So this is not the first time domicile based reservation has been introduced by the state. Similar laws are brought in for other states also. For example, if you take Andhra Pradesh, it has attempted to introduce 75% reservation for locals in all jobs for public and also for private. This law was challenged in the court. Secondly, Haryana government also introduced 75% reservation in private sector. The Punjab and Haryana High Court said that this violates a fundamental right, stating it would create artificial wall throughout the country. So this matter is currently under the view of Supreme Court. Similarly, in Jharkhand, a reservation for providing 100% reservation for locals in the class of 3 and class 4 level jobs. Here, the governor itself returned the bill, stating it is unconstitutional. But however, the bill was enacted. The domicile-based reservation can also lead to problems like national and social disintegration and disruption of laissez fair, which is the policy of minimum government interference in business. It can also cause major economic impact where there is high inward migration. It can also reduce the competitiveness. So these are some of the issues associated with this bill. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Now look at this news article, Central Pollution Control Board will check the violations in plastic waste trading regime after four industries in Maharashtra, Karnataka and Gujarat have issued fake EPR certificates. That is, these industries have issued fake extended producer responsibility certificates. So here we have to know the basics of Central Pollution Control Board and what is extended producer responsibility certificate. Now let us get into the discussion. The Central Pollution Control Board is a statutory body and it is established under Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974. So CPCB was established in 1974 and it functions under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. CPCB also governs the matters under Environment Protection Act 1986 and Air Pollution Act 1981. So please note these acts. CPCB has a headquarters in New Delhi and it has seven zonal offices. The important functions include the regulation of air quality, water quality, waste management and pollution control. The plastic waste management comes under the waste management duty of Central Pollution Control Board. Now let us see about the plastic waste management rules of 2016. See these rules mandates the generators of plastic waste to take steps to minimize the generation of plastic waste. The rules also mandate the responsibilities of local bodies, gram panchayats, waste generators and street vendors to manage plastic waste. So this plastic waste management rules of 2016 was amended in 2024. Now let us see what are the new amendments in these rules. The extended producer responsibility which we have seen in the newspaper article comes under this plastic waste management rules. The new amendment to plastic waste management rules have classified plastics into four categories. Category 1 consists of the rigid plastic packaging. Category 2 has flexible plastic packaging which can have single layer or multi layer Category 3 has multi-layered plastic packaging. Category 4 has plastic sheet as well as carry bags made of compostable plastics. So these are the four category of plastics which is classified under new plastic waste management rules. Now talking about the extended producer responsibility certificates. The EPR certificates are issued under plastic waste management rules and it allows for the sale and purchase of surplus extended producer responsibility certificates. In the EPR scheme, the businesses have to recycle a certain percentage of plastics. So when the certificate is issued as fake, it questions the sustainable practices of plastic regulation. So this is why CPCB has involved in this. The extended producer responsibility means the responsibility of producers not only to take back the products for recycling, but also to design better and longer life products to minimize the amount of waste generator. So the EPR certificates is authorized by Central Pollution Control Board which is mandatory for producers or importers of electronic products. Under these rules, the producers have responsibility to delegate this responsibility to third party or specialized organizations. So this is all about the discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Now look at this editorial article from today's newspaper. India is facing a serious unemployment problem. 5.8% of workforce are without jobs in 2019. 
Additionally, the number of people working or looking for work, which is known as the labor force participation rate, has dropped to 49.8% in 2018. However, there is a positive sign, more women are starting to work. In rural areas, the number of working women went up from 24.6% to 36.6% between 2018 and 2022. This is a faster increase compared to men in the same period. So this suggests that if we focus on helping women to find jobs, it could help solve India's unemployment issues. To do this, we need to address challenges faced by women in workforce. So this is what the news article is talking about. Let us see the important points from the article. India's female labor force participation rate has seen a significant drop from 38.9% in 2000 to 23.3% in 2018. Despite this decline, there has been a positive trend in rural areas where the female labor force participation rate has increased by 12% in the same period. However, many women are still engaged in unpaid family work. So this highlights the need to targeted strategies to increase the female employment. The women's employment choices are often limited by traditional roles and societal norms. For example, in the slums of Buj area in Gujarat, women prefer home-based traditional occupations like bandhani and embroidery due to their flexibility. Even though these jobs offer low income, women prefer these jobs in these areas. So this preference is largely due to the lack of other employment options. Urban areas have seen a smaller increase in female labor force participation rate and this indicates the shortage of suitable opportunities for women. To enhance female employment, it is crucial to address these constraints and promote entrepreneurial activities. Firstly about creating flexible work opportunities. Then about skill development and training. Encouraging women to start their own businesses through access to credit and resources can foster economic independence. This will also reduce the reliance on unpaid family work. Efforts should be made to address the societal norms. We have to change the societal attitudes that restrict women's employment options. We have to ensure safe and supportive work environments, including facilities like child care and transportation, so that it is easier for women to enter and remain in workforce. Now let us see the government initiatives to increase the women employment rate. Firstly, Mahila Shakti Kendra scheme. It was launched in 2017 and it aims to empower rural women through training and employment opportunities. Secondly, National Skill Development Mission. It targets to improve the skill of 500 million youth including women by 2025. Thirdly, Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana. It provides vocational training to women with a 30% reservation for female candidates. The Stand Up India Scheme, Beti Bachao Beti Padao Scheme, Women Entrepreneurship Platform Scheme also encourages and trains women for labor force participation. Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana provides financial support to women entrepreneurs through microfinance institutions, banks and non-banking financial companies. As of 2023, 68% of mudra loans have been sanctioned to women. According to India Employment Rate 2024, these initiatives aim to address women employment but more needs to be done to achieve significant impact. Now let us see the reasons for declining women employment in India. Firstly, there is a lack of opportunities. The data from National Sample Survey Office shows that education and employment have U-shaped relationship. The work participation drops sharply for women with primary and secondary education and rises only with college level education. A 2018 study has found that the time spent on unpaid economic activities performed at household by the woman is one of the most important determinants of female labor force participation. So the time spent on unpaid work, especially on unpaid care and domestic chores, has hindered women's participation in labor force. Then there is also gender bias, constraints in the form of casteist and patriarchal notions especially in the food processing, sericulture and garment industries has added to the low participation. According to World Inequality Report 2022, men in India capture 82% of labor income while women earn just 18% of it. This wage gap can discourage women from seeking formal employment opportunities. So this is all about the discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Now look at this article, it talks about the role of India membership in both Quad and BRICS organization. It talks about the geopolitical security in Indo-Pacific region, global supply chain for critical technologies, Russia-Ukraine and NATO issue and also about China counterbalance. So in this context, let us have basic understanding of Quad and BRICS. 
Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which is commonly known as QUAD, is a strategic security organization. Its members include India, Japan, Australia, and United States. It was established in 2007 by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The purpose of establishing QUAD is diplomatic and military arrangement which aims for free, open and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. Now coming to the BRICS. BRICS is an acronym for Brazil, Russia, India and China and South Africa. The founding members were Brazil, Russia, India and China in 2000. Later, South Africa joined in 2001. Iran, Egypt, Ethiopia and United Arab Emirates joined the organization in 2024. The purpose of BRICS is to establish a counter-organization for G7 and also for investment opportunities which are aimed for geopolitical and bilateral relations. Other important initiatives of BRICS include New Development Bank which is headquartered at Shanghai, BRICS Contingent Reserve Arrangement. So these are some important facts about BRICS. Now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Look at the first question. Consider the following statements regarding morbidity rates in India. Look at the first statement. Northeastern states have highest morbidity rates. This statement is incorrect. As we have seen in the discussion, Kerala has the highest morbidity rate in the country. Northeastern states have lowest morbidity rates. Now look at the second statement. Non-communicable diseases account for a major share of morbidity. Yes, this statement is correct. Now look at the third statement. There was a gradual decline in morbidity rate in last two decades. This statement is also incorrect because there was a general rise in morbidity rates in last two decades. So the correct answer is option A. Only one statement is correct. Now look at the second MCQ. Which of the following statements are correct about BRICS? BRICS consists of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. This is an obvious statement. It is correct. Look at the second statement. BRICS was initially known as BRIC before the inclusion of South Africa. Yes, this statement is also correct. New Development Bank is a multilateral development bank established by BRICS countries. Yes, this statement is also correct. The first BRICS summit was held in Shanghai in China. This is incorrect statement because first BRICS summit held in Russia. So the correct answer is option B, 1, 2 and 3 only. Now look at the third question. It is about Central Pollution Control Board. CPCB was established under Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974. Yes, this statement is correct. CPCB is responsible for coordinating the activities of State Pollution Control Boards. Yes, this statement is also correct. CPCB coordinates activities of State Pollution Control Boards. Now look at the third statement. CPCB operates under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Yes, this is obviously correct. CPCB is involved in monitoring air quality and water quality across India. Yes, this statement is also correct. The correct answer is option D. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.